Hello. Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. I'm Demetra Nightingale, and I'm an institute fellow here at the Urban Institute. I also um, direct the Urban Institute's Federal Evaluation Forum. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today for our first um, Federal Evidence Forum of 2020. And uh, it's hard to believe it's 2020 already, but it is. Today's session is uh, jointly sponsored by the Urban Institute and the Forum for Youth Investment, which you'll hear more about. And the topic of the session today is stakeholder engagement in evaluation evidence-based policy. We're going to hear about a range of approaches that are used to engage various stakeholders at various um, levels of the evidence process, but especially in developing learning agendas. We'll also talk about engaging stakeholders in other stages of evidence building, that is in designing evaluations, conducting evaluations, analyzing results, and then using those results. Stakeholders include administrators, staff, uh, program participants, group representatives, and any other uh, category of people who are in this room and listening. So today we're focusing mainly on learning agendas and on youth and family services programs as context for our discussion. But the lessons are similar for any federal or nonprofit um, organization that's working to strengthen or develop their evidence building capacity. So that includes, and I know we have representatives here from IRS, NASA, CDC, uh, Department of Energy, libraries and museums, and a whole lot of other uh, entities as well. So hopefully you'll all get something out of it. Today's forum is especially important for the implementation of the Evidence Act, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policy Making Act of 2018, I think. Um, federal agencies are expected, most federal agencies, to develop learning agendas and evaluation plans, to initiate rigorous evaluations, and then to use the results to improve programs. Many of the federal agencies that are in this room, and some that aren't, um, now also requires state and local programs and grantees who receive federal funding to also uh, build their own evidence capacity. So I particularly want to thank the funders of the Urban Institute's Federal Evidence Forum, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, Arnold Ventures, and the William T. Grant Foundation. Their support um, over these past few years and funding of the forum allows us to host events like this and to also provide technical assistance to any of the federal agencies um, that request assistance from us as they're building their capacity. We're truly fortunate for the uh, ongoing support from these foundations. I encourage everyone here to continue today's dialogue by sharing your thoughts and observations on social media using the hashtag uh, live at urban. And please include speakers' Twitter handles Twitter handles, which are displayed on the agenda that you have. I also want to especially welcome our virtual audience um, watching uh, through the webcast live stream. We always have at least as many people online as we do in the room. Um, all you virtual participants, you can also participate by submitting questions um, to the panel by email at um, events at urban.org. At the Urban Institute, um, evidence is at the heart of what we have been doing for 50 years. Research, evaluations, data, and facts help all of us to understand the country's most complex economic and social problems. Our goal is to use evidence to elevate the debate. And so through our Federal Evidence Forum, we hold several events <clears throat> a year. Um, we produce uh, practice and policy briefs for the public. And we work with federal agencies as they establish and strengthen their evidence building capacity. All this is very much in keeping with the Urban Institute's longstanding commitment to evidence based research. As you can see on the agenda, we have a, an incredible panel today that will address how stakeholders can be involved in developing learning agendas and in all of the stages of evidence building and at all levels of government and programming. We hope that this session will be useful to agencies building evidence and strengthening their evaluation processes, and useful also to those who conduct evaluations and to those who use evidence and results to improve their programs. Finally, before turning the program over to our partner and panel moderator, Mary Ellen Wiggins, who's the Director of Policy and Research at the Forum for Youth Investment, I want to introduce uh, Vivian Singh, 
Senior Vice President of Programs from the William T. Grant Foundation. And she'll offer some introductory remarks about the importance of stakeholders and how the foundation views and promotes stakeholder engagement. Um, their leadership and Vivian's leadership over the years in building evidence capacity and stakeholder participation has really been critical to all of us. Vivian. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and on behalf of my colleagues at the William T. Grant Foundation, we are so pleased to be able to be one of the supporters in this important work. I thought I would um, start my remarks with just a few thoughts on why, at the Foundation, we care about these issues so much. Um, our mission, if you listen to NPR at all, is supporting research to improve the lives of young people. So that means we think that the work we're doing um, the research we're supporting has to have an influence on policy and practice in order to improve the lives of young people. And that's a really uh, hard uh, goal to achieve. It shouldn't be, but it has been. And in many ways, it's because of the ways in which our research and evaluation work and communities have been structured for a very, very long time, for decades, perhaps even a century. So if you think about it, the academic community um, has developed in its own right and all, often quite separately from the needs of the policy and practice communities and the needs of local communities. So even while academics have studied policy, practice, and communities, it's not always fit the information needs of those communities. And it's the same with the broader research and evaluation community. The ways in which the research and evaluation community has traditionally gone about its work, it's often been developing the research questions and coming up with studies independently of what the most pressing policy and practice questions are, and irregardless of what the most important questions are to communities as they would self-define them. And you see this uh, broader set of issues played out, you know, within the ways we've structured our government agencies, right? So we also have a long history of research and evaluation offices within government agencies working sometimes in parallel and not with adequate coordination with policy and program offices and with leadership. And so we see this played out, these silos played out so often um, across um, our, our country. And so this effort with the Evidence Act um, and to bring, uh, use learning agendas as a way of bringing together the best of research and evaluation with the actual policy, practice, and community needs is very significant. It is, uh, uh, in many ways, it's transforming the ways in which research and evaluation has been con traditionally conducted. Um, and I'm here to say that you know, this work happening at the federal government is happening alongside work that's also going on at the state and local level. So for many years now, there's been a growth in work on research practice partnerships at the state and local level, um, in education in particular, but also in child welfare and in a range of other areas where folks are developing long-term partnerships um, between research and evaluation programs and policy makers in order to co-define what are the key problems that folks are trying to solve and how can research and evaluation really help drive change. Um, and they have to be long-term relationships because a lot of times these interactions have been um, fleeting and maybe they last so long as a grant lasts. Um, or so long as a particular initiative lasts. And, that, and we, I think most of us know that most of the problems we care about are not solved so easily in such short time frames. So the value of thinking about these as long-term endeavors is really um, important. And so I just want to share a resource for folks. Oops. Did I? I might have hit the wrong button. <laughs> Ivy. Ivy will know how to forward the slides. Um, and so at the Grant Foundation, we've developed a resource website um, for folks. Um, and basically, we're just curating and bringing together um, what have folks been doing at the state, mostly at the state and local level, to some, to some modest extent at the federal level, to um, create these lasting and meaningful partnerships. Um, 
and, uh, and to pull together resources and guiding tips and examples of work um, that would be useful for the field. So we invite you to take a look at that. This is a page on how to develop a joint research agenda. In many ways, when that's done well, it is very similar to what a learning agenda would be. Um, and, that, and then there's a range of other topics that are also covered um, about how to structure a partnership, how to communicate about research and engage stakeholders, staffing and training of partnerships, funding partnerships, a whole wide range um, of topics that might be useful to this group. Um, and maybe I will end my, my um, comments with one other plea, which is that even as we think about learning agendas and using and better producing in, um, research and data, um, we should really be keeping an eye on whether it's being used on the back end. It becomes very enticing to focus on the learning agenda and better building evidence. And we leave to the back end hoping it will happen that somehow the evidence will get used. And I would suggest what we really need to do is think about evidence use on the front end, not on the back end of these activities, but really on the front end to plan for the use of the evidence that's generated. So what are the key policy and practice problems that need to be solved? What is the time frame on which that, those decisions will be occurring? And how can we make sure then that we are building evidence and communicating it in such a way, creating those loops so that it is most likely to get used? Because I think ultimately that's going to get us to the better outcomes that we're hoping to see. So thank you. Thank you so much, Vivian, for that uh, context and insight. I'm sure that the uh, panel is going to come back to many of the points that you've just discussed. So now, without further ado, I want to turn the program over to our moderator, Mary Ellen Wiggins, and today's panelists. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Ellen Wiggins. I'm the Director for Policy and Research at the Forum for Youth Investment, where our mission is to change the odds that all children and youth can be ready for college work and life. And I'm very excited to be here with you today on this very important topic. Thank you so much, Demetra and Vivian, for that excellent framing and the important context that we should all keep in mind as we talk about learning agendas. Uh, we really have an amazing group of panelists with us here today to kind of dive into this issue and think about everything from what's the value of engaging stakeholders and learning agendas in the first place to how do you actually get it done and practical aspects of what you really do. Their full bios, which are extremely impressive, are in your materials. So I would warmly encourage you to read those for all the information about them. But let me just do some quick introductions here so that we can dive into our conversation today. So here we have Dr. Nicole Pat and Terry, mm -hmm. who made a trip all the way from Florida State University to be with us today. I apologize for the cold. Uh, she's a very busy lady there. You are the a professor of education. Mm -hmm. You are the associate director of the, I'm going to have to look this one up, I'm sorry, Florida Center for Reading Research, mm -hmm. and then also the deputy director of the Regional Education Lab for the Southeast region. Yes. Mm -hmm. So lots going on there, and you do a lot with research practice partnerships as Vivian was mentioning a bit about earlier. Mm -hmm. And then we're also very pleased to have Keith Fudge, who is all the way here with us from like a few floors up at the Urban <laughs> Institute. <laughs> Thank you for making that trip downstairs. Yes. Keith is a senior <laughs> policy program manager at the Research to Action Lab here at the Urban Institute, and has also done some terrific work in the past looking across agencies to understand things like how they do stakeholder engagement in learning agendas. And then, of course, we're very excited to have with us Maria Wolverton, who is the director of the Division of, Fam Division of Family Strengthening at the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation at the Administration for Children and Families at the Department of Health and Human Services. <laughs> so lots going on there. Who's one of the people who's going to be actively engaged in and has for some time been actively engaged in actually developing learning agendas. So we have quite a nice array of perspectives here, and it's really going to be a great conversation. So just to kick us off here, could each of you tell us a little bit more about your perspective? And from your perspective, what's really the value of engaging stakeholders in learning agendas? 
It could easily seem like just one more thing to do when agencies are on the hook to have their learning agendas. They have to have interim ones this September, then they've got to turn in their next ones next September. There's a lot going on. So what is the benefit to agencies of being really thoughtful about how they do stakeholder engagement in this process? Mm -hmm. And Keith, why don't we start with you since you've kind of had conversations across a lot of agencies about this. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is actually, I, yeah, I'm seven stories up, but this is my first time on the stage. It's a lot brighter than the <laughs> old building. Here, so. Um, so yeah, so um, I uh, am a co-author of a paper we produced back in 2018 with a very relevant title, Engaging Stakeholders in Learning Agenda Development. Um, so, uh, so in the process of doing that, so we, we, um, that was part of work, uh, the Urban Institute led a partnership called the Evidence-Based Policymaking Collaborative, which was funded by Arnold Ventures. Um, and as one uh, product for that, we conducted a set of interviews with uh, 14 current or formal federal staff, very senior officials, analyst level across eight different agencies to get a range of perspectives on um, what worked, what didn't, um, and, and really the key takeaway being what is right for your particular context when it comes to um, engaging stakeholders in the learning agenda development process, I should say, because we always do, that they gave their feedback, their spoke anonymously, and they were speaking on their own behalf, not necessarily representing their agency. But I would say, thinking about internal and external stakeholder engagement at the most basic level, of course, engaging stakeholders internally across the agency really should help you surface, prioritize, and eventually answer key programmatic and operational questions that can really help staff do their work better and have more impact. So that's kind of, you know, I think that's in the in OMB's implementation language very similarly. So that is kind of the core of it. But we also heard that the learning agenda process can really help others around the agency better understand the role that the research office plays and the activities it conducts. Um, and I want to um, think a little bit more about that uh, and hear from others about as we go forward about how, what that can look like. But externally, I think it can really signal priorities that the agency has for evidence building and generate excitement in the field. Uh, we heard that from multiple um, interviewees. Some agency staff really emphasize that sharing that list of questions, once you've developed it externally and widely, can help get a sense of what is already underway in the field and how to sort of prioritize places where feds either conducting their own research or funding other research have a comparative advantage and, and should be focusing their energy. Maybe they have access to richer data or you know some other, um, some other advantage. Um, and also that in some cases, engaging external stakeholders in the process can create down the line an accountability mechanism to make sure that that research is conducted and released. Um, so those were some of the things we heard. And um, I think just other high level takeaways was just emphasizing that it's important not to let it wait till the end. It has to be an iterative process. And we'll talk more, I think, about when and how you do both inter internal and external uh, engagement. Um, and that it doesn't end when the learning agenda is released. So there's, there are you know, agencies regularly update their agendas, but you should be thinking about how the dissemination plan mm -hmm. leverages those same stakeholders and how they can continue to benefit from what should be and is a living document. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yeah. And let's go to Maria next. So Maria, you live inside a federal agency mm -hmm. and you do this work. Tell us, what's the benefit? OK, so um, just to frame things um, where I am within our agency as background for this. So I work with in the Administration for Children and Families, which is an agency of the Department of Health and Human Services. So with passage of the Evidence Act, the Department of Health and Human Services will be charged with developing a learning agenda. But within ACF, and particularly in the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, where I work, um, we've been um, engaged in learning agenda development within our agency with our program partners in ACF. So I work in the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation, which is charged with um, evaluating the efficiency and effectiveness of the programs that ACF administers. And so within ACF, there are different program offices that oversee the various human services programs delivered by our agency. And so OPRE has been working in collaboration with our various program offices um, for a number of years to develop um, program-specific learning agendas, um, so even before the Evidence Act was passed. But now that the Act has, is real and gone through, um, you know, I think we've ramped up that work quite a bit with our program offices, but we're also beginning to think about how 
um, we can have an AC wet, ACF wide learning agenda that kind of rolls up some of what we're learning from our individual program office learning agendas, as well as contribute to the overall HHS learning agenda that's kind of being um, developed right now. So in terms of you know, how we see the benefit of stakeholder engagement, and um, you mentioned like, you know, is this another thing that we have to do? Well, I would say that in recent years, we're um, increasingly just um, having stakeholder engagement activities be part of kind of our routine work that we do. It's baked into all of our projects and activities to the extent that we can. So it's not really seen as some other thing, will we go do that now? Um, and within ACF and the work of OPRE, the research and evaluation work that we do, we are guided by what we call our ACF evaluation policy, and that has five principles. So it's rigor, relevance, independence, transparency, and ethics. So in thinking about stakeholder engagement, we can use that as a bit of a frame. So for example, the obvious thing would be uh, thinking about um, the principle of relevance. So is the work that we're going to do, the research that we're carrying out, or you know, the learning agenda that um, we're building with our program offices, going to be useful to our programs, the program partners that we have within the agency, as well as um, the larger field and external partners. And so we're, we're not at ACF in, in our research office in the, in the business of just basic science, but doing research and evaluation that is going to be useful to our programs and how they administer their programs, how can they um, improve their programs. So that's always on our mind is making um, the work relevant. And then more recently, we've been thinking about how stakeholder engagement can tr contribute to rigor. Mm -hmm. So getting beyond thinking about rigor as just um, you know, a design for a randomized controlled trial, but um, kind of what Vivian mentioned, are we asking the right questions? Mm -hmm. um, so we, we learn about that through our stakeholder engagement. So, you know, a lot of times we may design a study and think about it, you know, oh, this is a great idea, we need to know this, and we engage the stakeholder and say, well, that's not really what we need to know, and that's not going to be helpful to us. So it would really be better if we answered this question. And it also can um, lead us to a more rigorous or appropriate designs for the types of questions that we're going to be trying to answer. Um, so how do we match our design with um, the questions and to get to what we'd see as more rigorous answers in the end. So throughout um, today, I'll be talking, kind of sprinkling in some of the work we've done with learning agendas, but this also affects how we do all of our work related to research and evaluation. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, you have a little bit of a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what you do and how you see the benefits of stakeholder engagement playing out. Sure. So I am a professor at a university, right? And that means that I have responsibilities around research, teaching, and service. I am in the College of Education at Florida State University, so I'm specifically my charge is to train teachers. Um, to go out there and teach students, and it, my charge is to train future researchers who will inform the practice of education. That's one of my hats. The other hat that I wear with all the other acronyms has to do with conducting research through the Florida Center for Reading Research. So when I think of stakeholder engagement, I think of it in terms of research, innovation, and engagement. For the benefits of stakeholder engagement in terms of research are uh, very much so in helping us understand whether or not we are creating evidence that is useful, that is helpful to answering questions that are um, important and pressing for our stakeholders. And our stakeholders are going to be not just teachers, but their principals and their families and their children. When you look from the bottom up, but from the top down, there are also state education agencies and federal education agencies and policymakers who are all making decisions around education. And so we think about how we do research that can inform both from the bottom up and the top down. Um, innovation is another way that I think people forget or, or underestimate with stakeholder engagement. There's a lot out there that we do know. In particular, I'm in the field of reading research. We know quite a bit around what is necessary to teach children how to read. But there's still room for innovation, a lot of room for innovation. Because if we were doing it well, then all children would be reading on grade level. And we wouldn't have these national stories around why so many children are not doing well in school. So there's innovation there as well, right? And 
what we look for in stakeholder engagement is helping us understand where are the pieces we're missing that we can then go create this evidence and do this research that will inform that. And then there's also engagement. And I think Vivian mentioned this, but everyone else mentioned this as well, that we are very good at creating evidence. We're not so good at getting people to use it. <laughs> so, and that's, that's hard. It's hard to, for us as researchers to create the evidence base that suggests that you should teach reading in this way and then ask individuals out there in the world to go do it just because you know we have this fabulous study that tells us that if you do this, it'll work, right? There's a lot of space between knowing what works and doing what works. And part of our role, I think, and it's an evolving role for individuals within universities, is to figure out how to engage with the public so that they can understand not only why this evidence matters, but how it can actually inform and improve the things that they care about. Um, so for me, it is very much so about helping others understand that this research, this science that we do, is a public good. I'm not just doing it because it makes this side of my brain itch because it's really interesting and cool stuff to think about. I am doing it because I really do think that it will provide a necessary end to improve whatever outcome that I'm interested in. And it's helping others to see that research is used for that purpose. It is a public good and it can be helpful to the public. Um, the work that we do, but part of helping people understand that is really doing robust engagement with them, and stakeholder engagement provides us the opportunity to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So, like I said, a really phenomenal <laughs> panel today, right? So, um, for the next question, I'd really like to target this one to you, Maria, if I could. We've heard a lot about who are stakeholders. Both Demetra and Vivian talked a fair amount about different groups of people that are involved, different communities. We talked here about internal versus external stakeholders in terms of thinking about who's inside a federal agency and then who's outside a federal agency. Mm -hmm. So Maria, having lived this a little bit already, how do you think about those different groups of stakeholders and balancing those opportunities for input as you develop and execute a learning agenda? Sure. So. Um, so I'm embedded within a federal agency, and as I mentioned, we work with um, various program offices within ACF. And so we would refer to those program offices as our internal stakeholders. So the staff who are in those offices overseeing, administering the programs, and the leadership of the program offices as, as well as ACF being our internal stakeholders. Um, external stakeholders, um, so the recipients of grants from ACF for our programs, um, who's out in the field delivering the programs, whether it's the administrators of those programs, state, local agencies, nonprofits, um, the staff who are delivering the actual services, the recipients of the services. And then there's a whole array of um, other engaged stakeholders, depending on what the program is. The, there's kind of a whole network of stakeholders for each program, so these might be TA providers, other kind of think tanks or nonprofits or um, researchers, groups of researchers that are um, focused on a particular area that's relevant to our programs. And so all of those are external stakeholders in addition to Congress who may be um, you know, mandating that we do certain research and evaluation studies that kind of are form pieces of our overall learning agendas. And so, um, I would say when we get started with a program specific learning agenda, the internal stakeholders are generally where we go first because they're delivering the programs. They're the ones who need the information to make their program work better and improve the program. But we're also kind of constantly in a process of, um, and as you mentioned, you know, not just thinking about today, but thinking five years out. So um, we have, activities where we bring in external stakeholders who might inform kind of our overall thinking and priorities for the next five years. And um, so we're doing that um, kind of across different areas of our portfolios. And then um, project specific work. So, you know, within a portfolio of work and when we award a new project, you know, that, that would be in conjunction with our program office internal partners, but then always doing um, stakeholder engagement through every stage of the project. So not just thinking of it at the end, oh, here's what we did, what do you think of it? But, um, you know, before we even finalize a design kind of going in, we've now started putting at the beginning of all of our projects, um, one of the very first activities we have is stakeholder engagement. So we start reaching out to the external stakeholders 
as soon as we start a new project um, that might be within one of our learning agendas to see, you know, ask those questions. Are, are, these, the, are these the right questions? Is, you know, we're thinking of this methodology. Um, so all of that before we even um, put a study out into the field. Great. Can you give us an example of a project? Okay, so, um, so we have quite a range of the way stakeholders might be involved, but some of the um, most of intensive stakeholder engagement that we've had in projects at ACF have been um, in relation to some of the tribal programs that ACF administers. Um, and in those projects, we have um, brought in uh, stakeholders from the tribes that are maybe grantees of ACF, um, and they have been actual partners in building the research. So not just getting opinions, but we've um, brought them in as members of the team. So um, one of the projects, and it'll be on a tweet, I think <laughs> a tweet about it, an example is the, um, we've recently fielded in the last couple of years, the American and Indian Alaska Native Head Start Family and Child Experiences Survey. And this is something that the FACES survey had been going on since the 19, late 1990s, and it had never studied the tribal programs in Head Start. And the um, way we got started on this study was actually stakeholders coming to us, uh, I would say about 10 years ago, saying, it's, it's time to think about this. So it, even, even the fact that we were going to, you know, uh, begin to do this study and think about how it could be done um, in the tribal programs within Head Start was initiated kind of a two-way conversation mm -hmm. with stakeholders about how might we do this. And then once we embarked on planning the study, um, those stakeholders were at the table for every single step of the project in designing it and were members of the project work group. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of like, you know, um, kind of on one end of the continuum of like maximum stakeholder engagement in kind of, you know, the entire way through the project from just initiating, are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How might we do it? What would the design be? How would we do the data collection? What are we going to do with the data after mm -hmm. the study's over? How are we going to disseminate the data? Who's going to be able to use the data afterwards? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that, that kind of bridges into the next thing I'd like to talk about, just getting really practical. So as we talk about stakeholder engagement, as agencies read the OMB guidance, it says they have to do stakeholder engagement as they develop a learning agenda and, of course, later execute and come back to it. Can we say more about what are, and Nicole and Rhee, I think you might have the most to say about this because of your, your more hands-on perspectives, um, although, Keith, we, of course, welcome your comments. Uh, what are the points in time, really, in general, when you should be engaging your stakeholders? And when you're talking to stakeholders who don't think about learning agendas all day long, what do you actually say to people so that you can have a conversation about it where everybody's on the same page? Mm -hmm. So, Do you want to go first? Sure. sure. So I, I think the, the, there's, may I preface my answer by saying that none of us are doing it right and all of us are doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. Only in the sense that it's a learning journey in and of itself. You, you, you learn as you go along with how it is that you do this and do it well. And as soon as you think you've got it, you're going to have to turn left field. So it evolves. So you often feel like you're not doing it right as soon as you feel like you are. And so, so, so it's okay to feel uncomfortable with that. Um, but the easy answer is you're doing stakeholder engagement the entire time. You do it from the very beginning all the way through, past when the funding ends, on and on and on and on. We talk a lot of, in um, our world around research practice partnerships. It's like a marriage. I mean, you're in it. And, and nobody's going anywhere. Y'all got kids. So <laughs> you can't go. So it, it, you're in it together, and you're really there down in the weeds. You've got to be flexible and nimble based on what arises, because as soon as you've got a plan, something will happen, right? And so it really is something that happens through that entire journey, hand in hand with whoever your stakeholders are. So that feels overwhelming, and I think part of what you have to do is figure out, um, and, and again, I think about this from top down and bottom up, you can have stakeholders at different levels and different ranges, and how it is that you choose to engage across all of those stakeholders. Every engagement with the stakeholder doesn't require a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, every one of them doesn't require a retreat. 
Some of them do though. So it's sort, I think you have to think about who the stakeholder you're engaging is and for what purpose and design your engagement opportunities to match that. Um, in my experience, we've been very successful with making sure that we have different forms of ongoing communication. So we do have face-to-face -face meetings, but we also have email exchanges. We have shared drives, SharePoint, Dropboxes, things like that where people can find materials that they need. We have newsletters that come in online. Um, so, we, so we try to have multiple ways to engage with each other. The other way that I think we've been very successful is that we're very clear in our engagement what the outcome is. People, if people are going to come to a meeting, they want to know that it's for a reason, right? Or if they're going to read an email, they want to know that it's for a reason. So trying to be very clear about why I want to engage you, what I think your benefit will be out of this engagement, I think can be very helpful with engaging your stakeholders. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a really helpful answer and on the intensive research practice partnership end. Mm -hmm. And Rhea, we heard your answer that was very integrated about working with tribal communities. Could you tell us some examples of sort of the points in time and engagement strategies that you've experienced that are at the sort of lighter end mm -hmm. of the spectrum, if you can't mm -hmm. quite go in deep? Okay. Sure. So I'll give some examples from what we call working with our internal stakeholders in the agency. I, I would say we can use any opportunity that we have to interact with program office partners um, to contribute to a learning agenda because um, we may and we do have all along the continuum from you know very um, we might be setting up a multi-day meeting with a program office just for the explicit purpose of coming up with a learning agenda and you know bringing all the staff and putting that together but the other end of the continuum, like the, the lighter touch that you say is a program office may approach us and say, well, you know, we, we, we have some data, we don't know what to do with it, or we kind of need some help figuring out what to do with our data. And just engaging in those conversations, sitting down, having that conversation, I see that as sort of a kernel of starting a learning agenda mm -hmm. because you're, you're getting into, you know, well, what do you need to know? Why do you, you know, what information do you need? How do you want to use it? And building from there and just kind of using those, you know, small, you know, initial interactions to then kind of build toward um, a larger learning agenda for whatever that program is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might add on that Please. point too. Uh, one thing we heard pretty consistently through the interviews that I thought was interesting when you're talking about those lighter touch and different kinds of internal engagements is, you know, while internal stakeholders tend to be involved kind of at every program offices around the agency tend to be involved throughout the process, developing the questions, prioritizing, executing. Um, there's a, there was a bit of an effect or a, or a sense that field offices often got sort of short shrift in that process or weren't engaged until later. And field, I could mean, you know, regional offices, city offices, or international offices in sort of the international context. Um, and so we heard kind of consistently from folks that oftentimes they, just for capacity constraints and just feasibility, they didn't bring them in until they kind of developed a lot of the questions and they asked them to help rank them. but. Sometimes they said the field office staff felt like we're the ones closest to the ground. We're seeing what the actual implementation challenges are. We'd like to be brought in more at the front end. And I think just as technology makes that more feasible, I think we heard a consistent desire to do a better job of engaging some of those internal stakeholders, but not the ones down the hall. Yeah. yeah. I think related to that then, uh, one thing I think we've learned, and it sounds very sim similar here, is that this process of communicating out to individuals through whatever means is a job. It is a part of the work. I think sometimes it might get the short shrift. You think that it do it's not as important, but it, it may well be just as important as the person who's designing your RCT study. You, you do need to identify who is the person or persons that is responsible for, for having this regular communication with your stakeholders and owns that. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a small part. It, it is a huge part of building those relationships and helping people to not only see that they're valued, but then on the reverse side to see that the work that you're doing, the research that you're doing, these learning agendas are valuable to them. So making sure you have a person or persons identified, mm -hmm. I think, is a, is a key um, strategy here. Mm -hmm. That's great. And Nicole, that really, that raises, I think, a really um, interesting question about 
the important role that there is for having the right you know number and amount and talents of people mm -hmm. but also people are working within limited time limited mm -hmm. resources limited staffing and money and there's just so much to do here so what are some ways that people can think really productively about how to best match the resources that they do have mm -hmm. with the kind of engagement that they mm -hmm can most effectively do? How do, you, how do you think about matching those things up? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so I think one challenge that we heard from multiple interviewees was when there is a mismatch between mm -hmm. your, the scope of the, the outreach you're trying to do mm -hmm. and the resources you actually have to do it. And so we you know, heard that it's critical to be really thoughtful about how you engage external stakeholders because if they don't feel as though their input finds its way into the final product, they mm -hmm. feel their time was wasted or disregarded, um, which is certainly not what anybody is intending. And so I think there's also this question of kind of, uh, when you think about scaling your external engagement, like fairness and representativeness, because if you want to do outreach, but you don't really have the capacity or resources, you're gonna lean on those people you know already, and those organizations that have better access to you, that are better resourced, that are the first ones that come to mind. Mm -hmm. And then they may have sort of a disproportionate impact on the type of things that make it into the learning agenda. Um, so I think if you are really resource constrained, you might lean more instead of trying to do a workshop where you're just going to be able to grab the people who can fund themselves to come there or who are on hand in DC, mm -hmm. you might lean more towards some of those broad based, more public things like requests for input or email outreach websites, public presentations. Um, I know like, you know, federal register requests for input can yield a lot and that's a capacity challenge in its own right. So not, that's not going to be appropriate in every case, but just being really thoughtful that you don't sort of push yourself in a direction where you're hearing from only the voices that have the best access. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, so in times where we don't have specific resources that um, we can put to that, we think about you know, putting out the requests for information um, and disseminating that widely to the field or thinking about where are our stakeholders? Are they at meetings, conferences, technical assistance events, going there? Um, uh, another example is uh, the um, maternal infant early childhood home visiting learning agenda that we've worked on. Um, the staff from ACF and HRSA who jointly um, oversee the program have over the last year or two gone to the various events that are happening around the country um, where state, you know, different stakeholders are and had learning agenda sessions that anyone was invited to. And so there's not a particular cost to that. And so we've been compiling the information across all of these different um, events that uh, we've been to and trying to, you know, look at the themes that are coming and then working internally um, with our offices to see, you know, you know what, it, what have we learned from all these different events that we've had. On the other end of the continuum, there are times when we've said, you know, we have to put resources into this or, or we will fail mm -hmm. <laughs> in getting the stakeholder input. So, um, you know, we've actually paid people as consultants on projects um, to bring in um, the stakeholder voice um, and also from an equity issue of like being equal partners on our project, not, you know, using people's time for free to contribute to our projects, but um, mm -hmm. um, making them equal partners. And so I think for any given activity or program area, we just kind of have to think about, you know, what's the balance, what are the resources, um, and how we're, gonna, how we're gonna use opportunities that exist out there to get input whenever and wherever we can. Mm -hmm. So think about what you can just naturally build into the things you're yes, already doing. exactly. And then where you really need something new and different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I think it's important mm -hmm. to um, make sure you're just not over promising or mm -hmm. under promising for that matter. The, the hard part about this is being transparent about what you can and can't do. You can't do everything. I'm sure I know I feel that from a university. I'm sure you feel that from a federal agency. There are some things you just cannot do, but we're not often as um, comfortable being transparent with our stakeholders about the limits of what we can and cannot do. Um, but I find, at least with the stakeholders that I engage with, they appreciate that. They appreciate knowing the parameters in which we can work so then we can be nimble and think together around how we can get the most bang for our buck in our engagement. And so I think just being very honest and transparent about the work 
the goals for this work, why we're here, what we're doing here, and how we can all benefit from it can go a long way. Mm -hmm. That's great. Right. So just very upfront with people about yeah. what to expect and following mm -hmm. through. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And Maria, you and you brought up a really um, important concept, and that is equity. And I'd actually, Nicole, like to ask you about this one, because mm -hmm. I know that I work at the Forum for Youth Investment. Equity is a thing we think about all the time. Mm -hmm. I know that in your field and education, it certainly is a major, uh, major issue and topic. And we could easily do mm -hmm. many events on this topic <laughs> alone. But just in the context of thinking today about learning agendas and knowledge building in general and stakeholder engagement, how do you think about mm -hmm. equity and stakeholder engagement together? What are just some sort of key takeaways or points that you might like to share? Sure. So I'm sure some of you or many of you have seen going around this picture, right, of kids. Or there's three kids looking over a fence into a baseball field, and they're at different heights, and they're sitting on these different boxes. And your general idea around equity versus equality, where equity is around everyone having what they need to succeed as opposed to quality, which is everyone having the same thing, right? So if we're using the equity lens, then all kids would be sitting at a level where they can all see over the fence and see the baseball game, right? So I think that's a helpful frame to think about it, but I challenge everyone in the way that I think about it is to consider equity from an individual level as well as a systems level when you do this work. So if you can imagine that picture, you can talk about individual levels of uh, equity of the individual children who are looking over the, those fences, but we can also think about it from a systems level. So who put the crates there? Who put the fence there, right? Why are we watching a baseball game and not a football game? Right? So there's systems involved here too that are producing these conditions that we're all trying to respond to in the work that we're doing. And so when, we, when I think about equity, I try to think about it from an individual level, things like, um, and Vivian is very good about this, you, this idea of democratizing our evidence. So we go out there and we get a lot of research and a lot of information about individuals that we never give that information back to, right? So if this information is about them, for them, of them, then what are our efforts to make sure that they are, are met full circle with this process, right? And how much of it is really for them and with them? Um, at the individual level, I think about who's at the table. Um, who, when we, when we create these stakeholder groups, when we go out here and we find our stakeholders, Who's there and who's not there? And who's not there because of convenience? Who's not there because they know the right people, as you mentioned before? Who's not there but simply because they just don't know that there is actually a seat there? And if, and if they were there, someone would give it to them, right? So I think about um, who's there and who's not there and how, what efforts, what is it at our responsibility to ensure that diverse voices are there at the table? What do we do to individually go out there and get individuals to that table? Um, from a systems level, I think about cross-sector um, partnerships to do the work that we do. I'm in, a, in the business of thinking about education, but I'm also very much so aware that the issues that we see with achievement in schools, in particular for vulnerable populations of children, are there because of, of forces that are happening in schools and forces that are happening outside of schools. So there are things there that have to do with housing, and there are things there that have to do with healthcare, and there are things there that have to do with nutrition, not just reading instruction and reading methods. So if I think about it from a cross-sector standpoint, then I can capture the system. So who in these different disciplines or who in these different areas should also be at my table to inform whatever it is I'm gonna do on Monday to teach a student how to read. And I think finally, the other thing I think about is those diverse perspectives. So um, to drive it home, I have a, a, a one of my mentors is, is Hall Scarborough, and she has a very um, influential um, framework for understanding reading development, and it's a rope. It's a, it's a rope, and it was talking about different skills, about subcomponents of reading skills and how they come together to build a rope. And for years and years and years and years and years, I kept referring to this as a braid, even to her in conversation with her as a braid. And finally, and this is after maybe 15 years, she finally said to me about six months ago, you know, it's a rope. It's not a braid. It's a rope. And I said to her, but you know, I've always thought about it as a braid because I think of braids. Because in my family and in my history, from my schema, when I think about pulling different braid, um, pieces together, 
I'm thinking about braids. I'm thinking about my daughter's hair, right? So just the, our two different schemas, our two different frameworks had, had us moving around a different path for 20 years, and this woman came up with the thing. So, <laughs> so I certainly shouldn't be questioning her when she came up with it. But that goes to show you the power of different perspectives at the table and how people see things so differently in ways that you might never suspect. But it absolutely changes the way that they do their work. And so from a systems level, thinking about those different perspectives, I think, makes a difference. Um, I would guide you towards two resources, I think, because I know you have to do this work, so I wanted to give you a couple of resources. There's um, a network called the National Network for Education Research Practice Partnerships. It's NERP, N-N-E-R-P-P. -P. If you Google it, you will find their website. They have lots of resources there, and some are specifically devoted to equity or at least lead you to places to think about equity. The other is an inst um, institution called Chicago Beyond, and they put out um, a, a playbook uh, really around issues of equity around doing research, and it's called Why yeah. Am I Being Researched? Um, and it really is looking at research efforts that have happened in Chicago with individuals who live in that community. And that general question, we do a lot of research around individuals who are vulnerable or at risk or disadvantaged. And, how much of that research has actually benefited those individuals. And so they have a nice toolkit there that is helpful in thinking about this from the perspective of a community member, from a funding agency perspective, from an a researcher um, or institution perspective. It's a nice way, I think, to frame the way we think about equity and the work that we're trying to do here. Thank you for that powerful answer and mm -hmm. thinking about all the points in time where that really matters and is a major consideration. Mm -hmm. So we've given everybody a lot to think about here today. <laughs> There's obviously a lot of work that goes into the, just the process of engaging stakeholders in both developing and then executing on a learning agenda. So before we move to our stakeholder engagement section where we have Q&A with the audience, um, could each of you just share what's your one piece of advice that you would give to people who are working in an agency who are thinking about how do I do stakeholder engagement as I embark on developing my learning agenda, um, whether those people maybe haven't had the chance to get started yet or are kind of wrapping up their early stages and wanting to make sure they didn't miss something important. What's your key piece of advice? Maria? I guess I would say is, is kind of view any interaction with stakeholders a learning opportunity. Um, and, you know, even if it's not a formal learning agenda activity that we've labeled it such as, mm -hmm. as treating that as sort of a two-way learning opportunity mm -hmm. and then kind of you build on those different engagements and, and then you can start putting together mm -hmm. the learning agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, to the extent that we've all been talking about having that sort of list of what your stakeholders are, doing a little bit of mapping. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, USAID produced this learning agenda landscape analysis that I think is a really formative document about all mm -hmm. stages of the process. And mm -hmm. they had this really simple characterization that I think was helpful. And it's like you should think about if you want a stakeholder or two, if you want to inform them, just keep them informed about what's going on, consult with them, mm -hmm. um, participate or involve them, or then actively collaborate with them. So like just mm -hmm. what that level is. And I think if you can start to map the stakeholders you have and what role and what degree you want to keep them engaged, um, it helps you think about what the right format, what the right strategies are, and then you can, again, match to your capacity and resources. Yeah. Um, I would add that, so that often in doing this work, that what you will hear is, is folks say, don't set the agenda, that you mm -hmm. need to hear from your stakeholders before you set the agenda. So I'm going to add a little nuance to that kind of know your agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so often when you go and work with stakeholders, they, don't, they, they can't formulate a research question for you. They're not really sure what the big picture is and what the big ideas are. They're not really sure how this works. And so part of your role is capacity building for them. And so you do want to have some ideas, but you want those ideas to be coming from your expertise, your content, your knowledge. Know your stuff. Know your content but know your context too. Know them as well. Do your work, do your background knowledge on them. Look at what their neighborhood context is, what their strategic plan is, what their issues are, the things that they care about. And know that coming into the room so that when you do start this conversation, you're coming from an informed perspective because if you expect them to just give it all to you or give you all the answers, they're gonna be a lot of crickets in that conversation. And, and it's gonna feel frustrating for them. 
-hmm. So come prepared. Know some, have an idea of where you think this is going. Nicole, that's really, that's really important and a very easily imagined scenario of being in the room and it's kind of crickets. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an example from your work of mm -hmm. how you might have started with a more academic research question or idea and how you had a conversation in plain language with people who wouldn't have used the same words as you mm. to describe the concept as they saw it? How did you have that conversation? Okay, so um, in, in Atlanta, we've done a lot of work around preschool to third grade pipelines. Um, and we have a research practice partnership that's focused on preschool to third grade, briefly because there's this divide. There's this magical thing that happens on September 1st when you go to kindergarten and everything's left, right? But now so many children in the US are in early childhood context. There, you actually gather quite a bit of information on these very young children that could be utilized to inform what happens to them when they go into a K-12 school environment. And so we're trying to bridge the divide there. Just the notion of thinking about P3, preschool to third grade, is a, is a, a term I might use academically. It's a term that I knew was floating around. But out there in the real world, there's birth to five and there's K to 12. And these mm -hmm. systems don't go together all the time. And so when I come in and say, hey, we should just, you know, grab your data and grab your data, let's just put it together. Let's, it, should, it, it only makes sense. Let's just put it all together. It's for them, it's not that that's not a good idea, but there is some real work to do on my part to convince them why would you ever do that? Why does that matter? How could it help you and those of you who live on the side of the world that aren't in K-12? How does it help you for those of you who live on the side of the world that are in K-12? Um, and so helping... There's, a, there's language that's happening in, the, in each of those different spheres, and we often don't know each other's language. And part of the stakeholder engagement is, is understanding each other and learning each other's language and understanding how now when we walk in the room, we are able to say, we're talking about this P3 thing, and I'm not talking about this birth to five thing and this K to 12 thing, but we are talking about this. But that took some time mm -hmm. for us to get there. Building the common language. Yeah, building a common language. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, great. Well, uh, thank you so much to all of you for answering my questions, and I'm hoping that our audience has a lot of questions. I have definitely been in audiences where people, you got to kind of like warm up your shoulder to raise your hand, although we also have some virtual people. So let's do a quick audience survey first. Who in here works at a federal agency and thinks that you might have a role in developing your learning agenda? Do we have any agency people? All right, very nice. I will note this is not scientific because I'm sorry to our <laughs> virtual participants that we cannot include you. Um, I should have set it up differently, but quite a few, okay. Uh, who here is not part of an agency but hopes that you're going to get engaged as a stakeholder and agencies will come talk to you? Okay. All right, a few people. And do we have anyone else who just supports agencies, whether it's through writing, consulting, whatever it is that you do to help people think about how to do this well. A few more hands. Okay, all right, great. So good, everybody's warmed up now. Had a chance to raise their hand. Okay, who has some questions for our audience? Let me give people a minute here. All right, let's start over here at this side of the room. And we have some mic runners coming around. Um, I'm Bob Lerman here at Urban Institute. Two points or questions. One is, <clears throat> How about legislators and uh, the Congress or legislators or city councils uh, who can really actually affect the result mm. once you find, is seeing what they're interested in, if they can at least formulate the question, then maybe they'll be interested in the answer. <laughs> mm. uh, the second point is that a lot of times, um, you know, agencies are a little bit reluctant to see their programs evaluated because um, there used to be a rule, the, the more rigorous the evaluation, the less likely you'd get a positive outcome. So <laughs> um, how do you deal with both of those? All right, great question. So let's start with the, the legislative branch question, whether it's Congress or a city council or county commissioners or state level or whoever it might be. Um, how do you think about interacting with the legislative branch as stakeholders? 
Anyone want to take this? Keith, was there anything that you heard across agencies maybe as they talked to you? We didn't hear a great deal about Congress being a really common, I mean, certainly, as you said, there is legislation that certain mm -hmm. things need to be studied and that needs to be factored into what fits within the learning agenda. I mean, mm -hmm. I think when we talked about buckets of uh, not quite internal, not type, quite external, in, external to the agency, but still federal uh, stakeholders. We were thinking about the role of OMB. We were thinking about the Hill. And I mean, I think there was a general, or even thinking about political, very senior leadership of your mm -hmm. agency. That, that if that getting input, whether it is uh, whether it is sort of mandates or just uh, engaging early on, you know, the more that you can make sure that you create some room for questions that are of priority, the better chance that the whole thing is going to be looked on favorably. So we definitely heard some sense of, you know, engage early, you know, yeah. they're not going to be in a day-to-day -day way involved in your learning mm -hmm. agenda development, but if you get a sense of where some of those priorities are, mm -hmm. um, it can really help when you get to the end of the process mm -hmm. for overall buy-in. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so think about on the front end, what is it that they want to know so that then maybe mm -hmm. people can put that knowledge into yeah. action? Great. Uh, and then our second question was, I'm sorry, remind me? Well, reluctance to evaluate. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. So, yeah. the, yes, reluctance to be evaluated. <laughs> yeah. That's right. What if people don't want to be a part of your learning agenda? Because mm -hmm. that's really scary. We definitely, and, and I want to hear from you too, but uh, we de this is a place where we heard that learning agendas can really be a bridge because in some cases um, that sort of perspective that the research office is there doing up or down evaluations, obscures all the different levels of evidence building and the ways that they can support operations. And by coming to those offices early in the process and throughout the process and getting a sense of what their priorities are, not just does this program work and do what it's supposed to, uh, you can kind of build those bridges. Uh, I don't know if that's been your Yeah, experience. so the learning agendas that we've developed thus far with program offices are not limited to RCTs. Right. Um, they may have a piece of it be congressionally mandated studies, but our first, what well, I would call it a first generation of learning agendas was basically looking at the full range of work we were doing, not just RCTs, but you know, performance measurement, continuous quality improvement, technical assistance, because we are learning from all of those activities. So all of those, um, if you see any of the graphics from our learning agendas, they incorporate all of those things, not just um, you know, an RCT. That, that, that's a piece of it, and that's one way we learn. Um, but that's not the only way we learn. And um, so I would say pretty much all of our learning agendas have these different buckets of activities and um, trying to define what types of things we're going to be learning from those different activities and how all of that contributes to the body of evidence that we're trying to enhance. Mm -hmm. I know I'm coming from a different um, place, um, but we've had the sa I've experienced the same issues in my space too, and I think if this is at all helpful, I think for both of your points, one of the things that we try to do is, is create an environment or a culture that wants, that has an appetite for learning and an appetite for questioning and an appetite for knowing, which often isn't there, right? Because we're just trying to get the day to day, right? And we're in high stakes mode here. Oftentimes I'm working with schools that or districts that have a lot of challenges facing them and they really just, they've got to get through to the state mandated test. Because if, if these, if it's X number of children don't pass, that's, there could be very negative consequences for them as a school, but also for the students that they serve and the families that they serve. And so, um, in many ways, it often feels like house on fire. And, and so they, they don't necessarily want to engage in, in something that might demonstrate that what they're doing isn't working. Um, but if you, if you can create environments where people um, come to understand that this is about learning, right? It's the learning agenda part of this, that this is about helping us all come together to figure out what it is we know and what we don't know so that we can make this better and that we're going to do this together. Um, we have things like no surprises clauses. We don't put information out without people looking at it first. Um, it doesn't mean that we don't put the information out there. It means that, that we engage with them before we put the information out there so that we can give them talking points. Mm -hmm. We can give them ways to talk about and have some nuance around what the findings are so that it doesn't feel like it's front page news, you're doing everything wrong, but it feels much more uh, look what we've learned and based on what we've learned, here's what we're going to do. Um, so we try to do that. That's not, it is not an easy thing to do. We really struggle to do it. 
But if, if we can get folks to start looking at this as a process that is about learning and that we know so many things that because we've learned, we can do things better, then I find that people are much more inclined to engage with you, um, policymakers included. Thank you. All right, other questions? Let's move to the back here. I'm Clint Brass from the Congressional Research Service. So uh, one of the challenges kind of with organizational learning out there is that you can't always plan for exactly what you're going to learn. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of serendipity mm -hmm. uh, potentially in some organizations set up shops to allow for kind of real time adaptation of their learning agendas. Can you talk about uh, maybe some of the challenges that you see or if real time adaptation of learning agenda is um, something you're thinking about? So my, my best memory of the OMB um, <laughs> guidance to agencies is that learning agendas are on a four-year cycle, and then there are also annual refreshes. So we do have a couple of inflection points kind of built in there for thought and reflection. But how would you all answer that question? How do you stay nimble and adapt? That, that is not a structure I'm familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and there is, there's also the, evalu the sort of annual evaluation plan, too. Right? So there's a couple different ways to mm -hmm. influence the process, but uh, I don't mm -hmm. know if you have a... Yeah. <laughs> or Maria, is there an example that you can think of mm -hmm. um, from learning agendas that you've supported in the past, where you found the need to evolve along the way, um, change some of your questions, and kind of what that looked like? I, yeah, I think it's a process of having the conversations with our stakeholder <laughs> partners um, to convey the message that this isn't just a one-time thing, mm -hmm. you know, that we have a learning agenda done, that's it. But so um, kind of setting up um, occasions that are recurring where we're always looking at the learning agenda and, and what's flowing in at any given time. Um, what are we hearing from the field, different stakeholders? Like I said, these different opportunities where we can engage with stakeholders and how do we constantly update our learning agenda to incorporate that. But it is a process of mm -hmm. convincing people that you know, we're not just done. We had a meeting and we developed a learning agenda and that's it and, yeah. and we did that. So um, it, it is a conscious effort to, to keep having the conversations about mm -hmm. what are we learning? You know, we just finished this study. What is that gonna tell us to inform these next things and how does, how does that fit in with the learning agenda? Yeah, I mean, I think we talk about the importance of it being a living document, but mm -hmm. actually having the, capa the staff capacity and the appetite right. to be continually doing that and also just recognizing the research timeline versus the timeline of mm -hmm. the political timeline and all these other things, it can, mm -hmm. it can be mm -hmm. longer. But I mean, that's a great question. I think something that I hope agencies are really thinking carefully about. Yeah. So it sounds a little bit like maybe kind of building a muscle to do this and mm -hmm. remembering to practice Hey, this is an opportunity to think of our learning agenda as a living document or something that we might revisit. Mm -hmm. okay. We certainly talk a little bit about, I don't know if this relates, but the, one of the challenges of doing work in this way is the rapid response, being, um, being able to provide your results quickly. And we're never as fast as we'd like to be. And so more and more you hear people saying that one of those, I guess, the don'ts is waiting until the end. Don't wait until the study's yeah. done. Um, to, to now talk about it because things have probably moved in the, in the timeline of when whatever the, the schedule for the study was, something has probably changed already. And so it's an uncomfortable place for us to be in particular as researchers because we certainly don't like putting things out there where we don't know the answer except you kind of forget that that is the nature of science. It's always evolving. There are very few things in the world that we absolutely know 100% the answer to anyway. But don't tell us that, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a, it is an uncomfortable place to be to say we kind of know. We're kind of almost done. We kind of think we know this. But there is a part of this, I think, in communicating with stakeholders that you want to continuously keep them updated as things are progressing so that if you do need to, to adapt or be flexible, it doesn't come nine months later and your results are no longer relevant anymore. So Nicole, I have to say, something I've heard you say a few times now is uh, you've talked about being uncomfortable mm -hmm. because you're kind of out on the edge of learning or you're mm -hmm. having to adapt. 
Um, it just sounds like being uncomfortable can just be sort of a normal part of the process and maybe even a sign that you're doing it right instead of that you're doing it wrong in certain cases. It could be just mm -hmm. me trying to convince myself then, <laughs> that I'm doing it. It's, it maybe it's my Wusa moment, it's my Zen moment. Uh -huh. um, I think the more that I engage in this work with more people nationally are doing this work, it, it does give me a little bit more comfort to know that everyone is struggling with what is the, white, the right way to do this. We have some ideas. We have some guidance. We have examples of people who have gotten a little further ahead of us and how they're doing it. Um, but, but, it but it is uncomfortable. It, it, there is no real playbook for exactly how to do all of this every time the right yeah. way. It, it's hard. It is really hard work to do. I think in some ways that's why we don't do it. Um, mm -hmm. It's much easier to just keep doing what we know. Um, but I, the, the, the part of me that says that because you're a scientist you have to be innovative tells me that this, that is also part of the job description. Right? So if you're a researcher, part of your job is to innovate. It's come up, coming up with new ideas and new ways of doing things. And um, I think um, Vivian hit the nail on the head there. We are very good at creating evidence. We are not as good at figuring out how to get people to use our evidence. And, and we bang our heads against the wall all the time around all these wonderful things we know and create and do that no one uses. So it's, and it's uncomfortable to go into a new space to figure out how do you do that? Um, but who better suited to do that than us, right? So I, I believe in us. I believe in what it is that we are capable of doing should we decide to do it. And it's, it's uncomfortable and it hurts and it, it feels that safe, but it is exactly where we should be. Who better than us to do this? Who better than the people in this room to do this work? Mm -hmm. Great. And it looks like we had a, all right, let's start in the, now we'll swing all the way over to the side and kind of work back towards the middle, right over here. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Abby Rosenberg. I'm with Aptive Resources. My question is around collaboration across departments and agencies. So naturally, there's going to be a lot of audiences that are stakeholders for various entities. How, um, how Do you know of any efforts? Can you speak to some of the efforts going on or potentially in the future that would link the efforts for engaging stakeholders or developing the learning process across different government agencies and departments mm -hmm. so that we're not tapping into the same resources multiple times and, and being effective with the dollars and efforts spent? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a great question. I know that uh, there's a group of stakeholders that's working on it, uh, are having conversations, I should say, about an opportunity youth agenda, research agenda. So, uh, and of course, the federal government has an interagency working group on youth programs that thinks across, since of course we're focused on youth, um, thinks across the different departments that touch youth in their lives in some way. So I think that's a great example of um, how, looking at where there's an existing cross-agency effort and thinking about how to build on that from either a research agenda or a learning agenda perspective. So that's one example. Does anybody else have one they'd like to share? Okay, but clearly a great charge, thank yeah. you. All right, working our way around. Who else has a question? I saw some other hands. Yes, please. Thank you. Jennifer Brooks, I'm an independent consultant. Um, and I ha I'm working with an agency in ACF actually with OPRE on a learning agenda. Um, so I have a couple questions. One is, to me, the difference between a learning agenda and a research agenda has to do with the stakeholders. I work with Project Evident, and one of the principles there is putting the practitioners in the driver's seat for this work. So I guess one thing I would ask you all is about not just engagement of stakeholders, but ownership mm -hmm. of the learning agenda. Whose agenda is this? I know some of them have been built around the policy priorities of the agency. Um, how do you make this a learning agenda that is for the policymakers and the programmatic folks and not for the researchers. Um, and then my second question is actually given that, you know, Congress is going to want something different than what the agency directors might need, which is different from what a grantee might need. Like this is where I see a lot of breakdown in the research is that the questions we ask maybe at the level of practitioner, we need the policy answer. It's a policy and we need the practitioner level. How have you seen agencies balance across those different stakeholders in terms of whose priorities take preference? So, uh, 
I invite the panel's response to that. Certainly, Maria, it sounded to me like the example you gave of working with tribes was a really thoughtful one that maybe um, embraced a lot of different stakeholders coming from many different perspectives, uh, different cultural backgrounds and communities, as well as different roles in the process at once. Does that seem fair? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And in terms of like who, uh, the question came up early on is what kind of who owns this work? Um, not just the process, but in the end, what, you know, who owns the data in the end? And um, that was definitely part of the entire process and conversation and kind of engaging in that kind of tension of, of thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And do you have any advice or insights for people who are kind of grappling with that and having to ask those same questions? Wherever, whatever the answers end up being, What's an advice about how to have the conversation in a constructive way? I think we tend to focus on, you know, what do you, with our internal stakeholders, what do you need to know to do your job and to run your program? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a research agenda that we have. I mean, we have, we can probably come up with a lot of research questions that would be fascinating to answer. Yeah. But given that, um, you know, if we work <laughs> um, on the part of the program offices, it's really important to, to understand um, what they need to know, but also kind of in the larger field, the, the um, stakeholders, who, people who are implementing programs in the field or, or using the information, like how, how how are they going to use the information? What, uh, thinking from a dissemination standpoint, what, how does it need to get to them in order to be usable? Mm -hmm. And so always kind of thinking about those questions at the beginning. And, and yeah. I think, I, I agree, it's not just like a, a, a learning agenda is much broader than what we would say is a research agenda. Mm -hmm. And always trying to remember that there, there are other components, um, research project studies may be a piece of that, but those are not the only types of questions. And I think here, good to think about that the Evidence Act ties the development of the learning agenda to the strategic plan and that they kind of move in parallel to each other. So I'm thinking of, I was at HUD for seven years in the Office of Policy Development and Research, was not deeply involved um, in the development of the learning agenda, um, but, you know, as part of that process, and that was an agency that committed quite a bit of resources, did a big conference, actually engaged external stakeholders very, very early on in this research roadmap conference. Um, but they strategically kind of chose to bucket, kind of write framing memos, bucketed around what the, stri the strategic plan's um, main categories were. Now, they were big categories of strategic planning sort of uh, documents often are. So there was a lot of room to work within that. And there was an other category for things that didn't fit. But using some of that categories, parallel kind of categorization uh, meant that there was a higher likelihood that it would align, at least during the term of the current that current administration, with what priorities were and make it a more actionable document. Um, and so I think you know the Evidence Act takes a similar tact, and I imagine that can has real upsides, but probably when if if there's a change in administrations, can have some downsides to the like. Can, well, would that mean that the learning agenda might shift more from iteration to iteration than it would if it were separate from that process? So, okay, some great alignment with the strategic plan to think about what can result in good action for the agency overall. And I think, right. Maria, from you, I was hearing a lot about um, understanding how things will be used in the field if you're looking for different perspectives to really think through how relevant is this, how can we make it rigorous, and kind of how can we make sure that we are framing what might be learned for this particular stakeholder group or this particular role in a way that shows we can follow through on it? Yeah, I mean, it's something that we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. What you said is, how is this actionable? Mm -hmm. How are we going to use this in, you know, mm -hmm. a way that, you know, that we, it's a policy lever or, you know, how do we take this and make it actionable? Mm -hmm. Great, great. And we've got time for one more question. And I see a, a hand that's been up here in the back. Shelley. I think, I'm not sure if this is a question or just some thoughts coming out of other people's questions. Uh, Shelley Metzenbaum. Uh, and it's sort of two parts. One is, I'm really, uh, as I listen to you talk about various things that go on, I do a lot of work now with the National Head Start Association. I used to work with the environmental agencies. 
I think there's real opportunities for government agencies to go to the conferences that these organizations yeah. have mm -hmm. and ask them to actually bring their people together to identify the research questions their attendees have. Mm -hmm. The federal government agencies can then decide whether or not they want to play a role in answering those, but just getting those members to start to ask, okay, what do we actually want to know and put that down and then you can start to come back to each year or even, you know, whenever they meet and sort of say, okay, we actually been able to help you put together information about the questions you had and we've actually moved some research here or maybe they have and then what are the new questions coming up? The second thing, and I want to pick up on somebody's comment on the evaluation and the fear of evaluation, is I think one of the places we've matured a lot in terms of thinking about the learning agenda is that the questions really aren't so much what works because the problems exist and so we have to think about, you know, really not, not does the program work, but rather, okay, how do I learn how to improve on the programs? And I think about like in the early childhood area where I would love to see the research on how do you increase the percentage of parents who read to their kids every night or families that read to their kids, you know? How do I increase attendance rates? And there's some really good analysis going on at local Head Start um, programs and National Head Start Association is trying to pull some of that together, but man, it would be so great if we could get those kinds of questions, you know, answered. And so I don't think, I think we need to, as we think about the learning agenda, move beyond just the, does the program work to what practices work for and for youth. You just did that with your component study. And how do we help people? We need to do more learning to sort of say that the, the point that um, uh, Nicole was bringing up, which was, um, and how do we diffuse knowledge successfully and how do we motivate uptake of knowledge once we have it? So I think, okay. you know, enriching our way of thinking about what should be on the learning agenda could be really helpful. Seeing a lot of noddings and great points. Think not just about how you can leverage what you're already doing, but what other people are already doing who you would like to talk to or hear from. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, thinking about the framing of our questions and improvement as being so important. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you all very much. And please join me in thanking our panelists. And Demetra did this already, but I, will also, I would also like to thank uh, the Annie E. Casey Foundation and William T. Grant Foundation for their wonderful sponsorship of this event. And before we close, I'd like to invite up uh, Bernice Butler, who is the Deputy Director of Network Learning and Collaboration at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. So she's someone who really thinks a lot about how to share learning across <laughs> a network, in her case of states, so these kinds of issues are very familiar to her. Please join me in welcoming Bernice. Good afternoon. Thank you all for having me. Um, and I think it's very fitting that, you know, we found someone who has not worked in federal government <laughs> <laughs> to close out this conversation, but also from a different lens. Um, at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, we really focus on research and making sure that that research is usable. And I think today, everything that the panelists have shared with you around the value of stakeholder engagement, what it looks like to build in and bake in those opportunities to constantly improve, really centered around five key values. And these values are collaboration, creativity, inclusion, shared power, and integrity. And so I know oftentimes when you begin to think about stakeholder engagement, both may or may not be the words that come to mind. But I want to spend just a tad bit in one sentence or two to talk about each of those. First, collaboration is really meant to break down the silos, whether those silos are internally, across agencies, within universities, within communities, those silos that separate our program officers from our communities and our constituents. That collaboration is really the heart of what makes a learning agenda learning based because that is the opportunity to foster partnerships and build strong relationships that last long beyond where the money comes from and how we do this work. That really adds the human and the partnership into the work, but then also the transparency and the honesty, because that is what moves us from transactional 
interactions to transformational relationships that move the learning to a place of impact. Next, uh, you don't really hear the words creativity and federal agencies in the same sentence very often. Um, but when it comes to learning agenda, one of the things that um, Dr. Terry mentioned was that innovation is key. Like, and creativity is really about separating the anxiety that we have around failing with whether or not we succeed. The goal is not to be perfect. The goal is to get better. And the purpose of a learning agenda is so that we continue to look at this work and do it better. And I, I'm from local government. I spent seven years working for mayors in different cities. And you know, this city stat model that's been all over the place in local government is really about how do we see what we've done, analyze what we've done, change how we act, and do that cycle over and over and over again knowing that we are not experts in every aspect of the lived experience of people on the ground and in different parts of government agencies, that we have to position ourselves to learn. And when you do that with innovation and with creativity, you have to give up that fear of failure. And sort of the, the two that I would like to group together that are kind of not new things to the government, but have been pushing us together to think about this work differently, are inclusion and shared power. This aligns closely with the work that Dr. Terry and Maria mentioned around equity and what that means. And so I wanted to be very clear about what I mean when it comes to inclusion. It is really creating an environment in which everyone's input and person are valued, and that the shared power is letting go of the traditional frames of power that allow members, and in this case our stakeholders, to really have some power and influence over what the questions are we're asking, how the data will be used, and when you do that, you create opportunities of shared ownership and shared accountability. So when it comes to the point where you have to release the data or talk about the data or lean in to share some things that maybe you aren't as comfortable with the outcomes of when it comes to the research, you have partners who are committed, who have been a part of the journey, who can share ownership and, and validate the work that you've put forward. And last but not least, there's integrity, which is at the heart of the best research and data practices, particularly when it comes to stakeholder engagement. And it's simply, it's like when you add in the experience from the stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are internal or external, you're adding validity to the process to really ensure that the questions you're asking are meeting the programmatic and lived needs of the individuals from which this data is going to be used in the end. And so I always like to end when it comes to research and data on a, on a quote that one of my mentors and former boss, um, Ms. Amy Gadara, who's the founder of the Data Quality Campaign, used to say that data is a flash knight and not a hammer. And so I'm going to build on to that and say that creativity, collaboration, inclusion, and shared power are the batteries to that flashlight. You really can't see that path forward if you don't intentionally find some things to help power that data and that innovation for the long term. Thank you guys so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Nightingale. Thank you, Bernice. That was great. And um, thanks to all of you for joining us today. And I want to thank, uh, again, our funders, uh, Annie Casey, Arnold Ventures, and the William T. Grant Foundation. And thanks especially to Mary Ellen and all of our colleagues and friends at uh, the Forum for Youth Investment. And um, all of the attendees, all of you will, uh, who are here in person, will be receiving a short survey in the next few days. Please um, fill it out. Give us your feedback on this session and on ideas for future sessions. Those who are joining us um, online, uh, please send your feedback on this uh, session and any ideas you have to um, e on email at events at urban.org. Uh, let us know what you think. We really want to hear from you. And now uh, join me in thanking the panel and the speakers. And I, it was great. And um, I say goodbye, um, have a good evening, and we hope to see all of you here at the Urban Institute again in the near future. Thank you.